In this video, I'd like to take a look back at the AT&T PC6300, an IBM clone released in 1984 that had moderate success in the United States. More than just a one-to-one -one clone of the PC, the 6300 had several enhancements that made it an interesting footnote in the history of personal computing. In order to look back at the AT&T 6300, we must start with Olivetti. Olivetti, an Italian company, was founded in the early 20th century as a typewriter manufacturer, and by the 1960s had developed some of the first transistorized mainframes. In 1965, they created the Programma 101, the first commercially produced desktop computer. In the 1980s, they decided to get into the consumer market, starting with the M20 in the spring of 1982. However, the M20 was not based on an Intel chip, did not run PC software, and failed in the marketplace. Olivetti learned from their mistake, and in 1983 produced the M24, a clone of the IBM PC running at a faster speed and with more built-in options such as a parallel port and a serial port. Most clones in 1983 had varying levels of compatibility with the IBM PC, but the M24 was fortunate to be extremely compatible. For example, it ran unmodified retail copies of both Lotus 123 and Microsoft Flight Simulator, both widely considered to be a litmus test of sorts for PC compatibility. Spurned by IBM's success at entering the personal computer market, AT&T devised plans to do the same. While the AT&T already had their desktop super microcomputer, the Unix-based 3B2, they had no such plans or manufacturing for the more casual consumer PC market. Olivetti's M24 was the most exciting prospect in early 1984, so they used Olivetti as an OEM, and in June of 1984 marketed the M24 in the United States as the AT&T PC 6300. Introducing the AT&T Personal Computer for Business. It's fast and flexible, runs most business software, and has a high-resolution screen for superb graphics. In short, everything you need to put your business ahead of the game. Your move. The AT&T Personal Computer. My introduction to the 6300 began with these two fine folks, Bob and Janet Leonard. My father worked for AT&T in the 1980s and used his employee discount to bring a 6300 home for Christmas in 1984. The first 6300 only came in a dual floppy drive model and had 128K of RAM. By the way, those switches on each drive were drive locks. When enabled, they prevented the drive from being opened when write operations were taking place. A later model of the 6300 was introduced in 1986 which substituted a hard drive for one of the floppy drives, which we also purchased, as I was monopolizing our single computer. The first decade of personal computers was one of adjustment to its target audience. These were powerful pieces of technology that consumers needed training to understand. DOS commands, common computing terms like ROM and RAM, and even how to properly turn your machine on were all basic concepts that needed to be taught to the new computer owner. The reference materials that came with the 6300 were no exception, and held the user's hand to the degree that the first pages you saw were instructions on how to unbox the computer. They continued with such introductory items as what floppy drives are and where they were located, how to properly handle a floppy disk, where certain keys are on the keyboard and their function, and even where to find your system floppies, even though you were holding them in your hand along with the manual. Thankfully, for those who weren't technical Luddites, the 6300 manuals delved into more complicated aspects of your new purchase, such as a comprehensive list of what each dip switch does on the motherboard. IBM included a simple tutorial with the PC and PC Junior, and AT&T followed suit with the 6300. The tutorial started with the various features and benefits of your new computer, followed by an introduction to the keyboard, and finally, common MS-DOS commands that would get you loading programs. The AT&T 6300 was more than a clone of the IBM PC. It was enhanced in several ways that made it better than the original PC in almost every way, both on the outside and the inside. Before I cover these features, I want to point out that the 6300 model you will see in most of these pictures is not stock. It has been modified by the previous owner to contain a makeshift 3.5 inch drive bay. This was never offered as an option by AT&T and is not standard. So, for comparison, this is a stock 6300. And this is mine. So, what made the 6300 stand out from its competition? On the front face below the disk drives was a handy reset button, making the 6300 one of the first clones to include such a feature. It saved you the trouble of reaching around back to the power switch, but was also kinder to the internal components than a full power on. The reset button was very handy for exiting programs that took over the entire machine and wouldn't allow you to press Ctrl to lead to reboot. 
The 6300 contained seven expansion slots, two more than the original IBM PC. Two of these were 16-bit slots, but as they were designed before the IBM AT was released, they only worked with 16-bit AT&T cards, such as an expanded memory board. If you had one of these cards, it had a full 16-bit path to the 8086 CPU, but these boards were expensive and uncommon. In this shot, you can also see how the backplane connects directly to the display card. This saved yet another slot. The 6300 also contains some standard features already built into the system, a parallel port, a serial port, and a battery-backed real-time clock that eliminated the need to keep entering the date every time you boot it up. This automatically freed up an expansion slot or two compared to the IBM PC, which did not come with those features as standard. Finally, the floppy controller was built into the motherboard, saving the owner from having to purchase one and use up a slot with it. The enhanced expandability as the result of the number of free slots was not overlooked by AT&T's marketing department, who used it in at least two commercials for the 6300. Not long ago, Bill bought an AT&T PC. Bob bought another kind. When they needed better graphics and even more speed, Bob got a new one. Bill just added it on. When they needed multitasking, Bob got another new one. Bill just added it on. Because with the AT&T PC, Bill could add on new features as his needs changed. So when Bob couldn't keep up with his business, Bill just added it on. AT&T, the computers with the future built in. From AT&T, the right choice. The keyboard was not as nice to type on as an IBM keyboard, but being designed by an Italian company, it had nice aesthetic touches, such as LEDs for the caps lock and numlock keys. IBM didn't add LEDs to their keyboards until a year later in 1985, with the introduction of the Model M. These LEDs also served a diagnostic function, as they flashed during the power-on self-test, and stopped once it was over. Unfortunately, these enhancements required a non-standard keyboard connector that provided additional voltage from the computer. This makes restoring a 6300 to working order very difficult without an original 6300 keyboard. But it was worth it, because the custom keyboard had another trick up its sleeve, the AT&T keyboard mouse. The 6300 keyboard had a mouse connector on it that looked like a 9-pin female serial connector, but was instead an early type of bus mouse connector. Coupled with either the AT&T 6300 mouse or the Logitech clone it was OEM'd from, this provided a way to hook up a mouse without using up any connectors in the back of the machine, or losing a slot to an interface card. The mouse came with rudimentary drivers and software, including a program called DrawWriter that allowed you to create simple diagrams with text, but there was a real innovation in the design of the mouse. Because it interfaced through the keyboard, the designer saw fit to have it send keyboard scan codes if a driver was not loaded. This means that without a mouse driver, moving the mouse up would send the keyboard code for up arrow, moving down would send down arrow, and so forth. The left mouse button sent the enter key, and the right mouse button sent the escape key. This meant you could use the 6300 mouse to control any program at all, whether or not it had mouse support. Here you can see me moving around Xtree, a popular file management program, using only the mouse, even though Xtree doesn't support mice. This was quite innovative for the time, and not duplicated in any other clone of its time period. The display subsystem in the 6300 was also proprietary, and used custom 25-pin display ports. Because it lacked composite color output, users were forced to buy one of the two monitors available for the 6300. While these were drawbacks, the display subsystem made up for it. It was CGA compatible, even down to the IBM CGA Snow artifact that was produced writing directly to video memory in 80-column text mode. But Olivetti designed their video hardware to have double the vertical resolution of CGA. While CGA displayed 200 lines, the 6300 displayed 400. This combined the crisp text resolution of IBM's MDA with the ability to display the color graphics of CGA, giving you the best of both worlds. There was even a special 400-line graphics mode, which we'll investigate in detail later in this video. There were two displays available for the 6300, monochrome and color. The monochrome monitor had the interesting property of getting both power and signal from the same 25-pin display port, eliminating the need for a separate power cord. The monochrome monitor emulated CGA color using different shades of green, but it could also emulate some aspects of IBM's MDA, such as underlined text. The color monitor had a finer dot pitch than IBM's 5153 CGA monitor, which was necessary to display 400 lines instead of CGA's 200. The power switch and contrast and brightness knobs were hidden on the top of the monitor just behind the bezel, which kept them out of sight but easily accessible. 
Despite programming languages from Borland and Microsoft adding support for the 6300's 400-line graphics mode, it was ignored by most programs, finding modest success in painting, word processing, and desktop environment software. I'd like to take a few minutes to show you some examples of these programs, which I'll present side-by-side -side compared to IBM CGA. For best results, please view this next section of the video full screen at maximum quality, so that every dot of resolution in the source material is visible. As previously mentioned, the 6300 shipped with seven internal expansion slots, but looking at this photo, the motherboard seems a little bare. The CPU, memory, and other chips are suspiciously absent. On closer examination, the motherboard itself is not the motherboard, but rather simply a bus converter. In another example of functional and stylish Italian design, Olivetti designed the machine with the motherboard facing the bottom. With the machine turned upside down and the cover off, you can now get at everything on the motherboard without having to remove any cards or drives in the system. Adding chips or flipping dip switches is much easier with this design, and I'm surprised it didn't catch on throughout the industry. Taking a closer look at the motherboard, you can see the standard 128K RAM chips, as well as the socketed additional 512K that was added afterwards. Moving upward, you can see two sockets for the CPU and the math coprocessor. In this particular 6300, the 8086 CPU was replaced with an NEC V30 CPU, a compatible chip that was roughly 20% faster. To the left of the CPU are three sockets for the ROM BIOS, which in this machine was upgraded to version 1.43. AT&T offered this to fix many lingering incompatibilities with software and add-on cards. The most notable addition enabled support for third-party video cards in case you wanted to upgrade to EGA or VGA. Continuing to the left, we see the floppy controller header, where the floppy cable disappeared into a slot in the case and was snaked up into the main portion of the computer. Finally, in the lower left, we can see some of the unique features of the 6300, the battery-backed clock, and the reset button. As noted at the beginning of this video, the 6300 you're seeing in most of these pictures has an aftermarket modification, a case and bezel alteration to support a third 3.5-inch drive. This was mildly clever, and I haven't seen this alteration described anywhere else, so I'll show you some pictures of it for reference. The previous owner carefully measured and cut away a section of the internal frame that was not in use, and then fashioned a holding bracket and attached it to the side of the existing drive cage. Flipping the case toward us, we can see the case modification from the inside. Uh, the drive cage opening is to the right. For this, he was careful to save some material of what he cut away, 
making the hole for the drive, and attached it using a metal plate and some glue. The final part of the modification is to make sure that there is a drive parm directive in config.sys that defines the existence of a second drive and its capabilities. So far I've shown you both the outside and the inside of the 6300, but how was the 6300 to use? Effectively twice as fast as the IBM PC due to the 8086 CPU running at a faster speed, everything had a particular snap to it that made the original PC feel pokey by comparison. Even IBM themselves didn't have a faster machine until almost a year after the 6300 was introduced, making the 6300 the only choice if you wanted a faster clone of the PC. While I could bore you with some footage of me working on the 6300, I thought it would be much more fun to compare a PC and a 6300 side by side, and see how CPU intensive games run on both. So I'll leave you with some classic game footage as it runs on both actual machines. Enjoy. <laughs>